Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'll be doing a quick review of The Long Cosmos by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. So this is book number five of five in the Long Earth series. The first book in this series was probably one of my favourites of the year, and it has, to be honest, felt as though it's gone downhill since then. By this point, I'm really just reading now just to finish the series, and so I wasn't feeling too engaged with it. And I think part of the reason for that was because a lot of the characters that we've come to know and love so far are now dead. So, like, my reason for reading has kind of gone a little bit with them. But I'm going to read the blurb here, and then I'm going to go through some of the flags I placed in here as I've been going, and then I'll share my rating at the end. So the blurb. 2070 to 2071. Nearly six decades after Step Day, and in the Long Earth, the new next post-human society continues to evolve. Joshua Valiente, now in his late 60s, wants to make one last solo journey into the High Megas. Only it's an adventure that turns into a disaster. Alone and facing death, his only hope lies with a group of trolls. As Joshua confronts his mortality, the Long Earth receives a signal from the stars. A signal picked up by radio astronomers, but also in more abstract ways, by the trolls and by the great traversers. Its impact will be felt by all who inhabit the Long Earths. So right away, one of the first things I want to mention is this little note right at the start. So we've got a foreword here, and it sort of explains how these books came about. So um, they'd originally planned it just to be one book, and then it was split into two, and then they couldn't resist exploring the Long Mars in book three. So it says here, The books have been published annually, but we worked faster than that. Time was not on our side, and Terry had other projects he wanted to pursue. Volumes 1 and 2 of the series were published in 2012 and 2013, respectively. But by August 2013, we had presented our publishers with drafts of the final three volumes of the series, including the present book. We did continue to work on the book subsequently. The last time I saw Terry was in the autumn of 2014, when we worked on, among other things, the Big Trees passages of The Long Cosmos, chapter 39 onwards. It has been my duty to see this book through its editorial and publishing stages. Because obviously, Sir Pratchett uh, suffered from uh, Alzheimer's and passed away. So towards the start, we get something that I think is interesting. Uh, even uh, half a century after Step Day, uh, still nobody's figured out how to send a message across the stepwise worlds other than carrying it by hand. So even though there is all this kind of new avenue for exploration, existing technology doesn't work that well. Which is why we have something in this called the Alternet, which is basically the internet connecting the different Long Earths. There's also a reference to some people making horseshoes on a world without horses because they still need the good luck. And I think it's interesting as well because they'd probably be made out of iron, and iron is like the one thing that can't be taken between worlds. Uh, Joshua, we have a callback to in the first book when he was a kid. Uh, Sister Agnes, one of the nuns who used to look after him, said he was the sort of boy who always paints before assembling. And it's quite a good description of his character. He is that kind of boy. And then Joshua meets his son, uh, Rod, who is now 38 years old at this point, And he offers him a coffee. And uh, Rod shakes his head and says, I managed to lose my caffeine addiction years ago. One less craving you have to fulfill out in the high megas. And I can see why that's... You know, that would be an advantage, not being addicted to coffee when you're in those those kind of survival situations. And then um, Rod doesn't want to have any children because he wants the, like, he, he wants the ability to step without a box, which is, like, I guess the superpower that Joshua Valiente has. He wants that ability to not be handed down anymore uh, because the family was bred together in the past. And then we get this little bit where Sister Agnes talks about, like, her approach to death. Basically, because she's like a robot, effectively, she's been brought back to life, she um, like experiences aging differently, and she says, um, Who would want to hang around to see that? She touched the papery skin of her cheek. There has to be a finish, Joshua. I learned that lesson from Shimi, who decided that in the end, all she wanted to be was a cat. I wanted to be a mother to Ben, and, well, that was all I wanted. And then I would be ready to lay down my burden. My adopted son is 19 already. Really? Believe it. Time just pours away, doesn't it? And I'm not sure how much longer I can fake all this aging convincingly. Also, there's a question of good manners. I've been through old age myself, but who am I to live in some kind of mannequin, mimicking all that pain and suffering for the sake of my own vanity, when I know I could switch it off at any time, when I could even be young again if I chose? No, I think my time should come sooner rather than later. It's right that way. And we have this little conversation where they talk about how everyone watches the same old movies, nobody makes new stuff anymore, because basically when everybody gained the ability to 
you know, go exploring, everybody buggered off and all the industries collapsed. I also think this bit's interesting, especially when you consider how, uh, you know, how crazy the world we live in is. You can see this actually happening here. This was a time when evidence was first spreading widely that some people were able to step naturally. That is, without the aid of a Lindsay stepper box, despite the official cover-ups. And the tension between non-steppers and natural steppers was mounting. Humanity had found the latest in a long line of subgroups to pick on, and a kit bag of discriminatory horrors inherited from the past was being rummaged through. In some Central Asian countries, according to human rights activists, they laced the bodies of steppers with iron, so that if you stepped away you'd bleed out of some pierced artery. Some states in the US were considering something horribly similar, where steel-based pacemakers would be installed into the bodies of high category cons. Step away and your heart stopped. At minimum, in most states, as in many countries around the world, natural steppers were being forced to wear markers of some kind, such as electronic wristband tags. The argument was that the tags were needed to keep track of potential criminals. Yellow stars, the critics called the markers. Johnson imagined this foolishness would pass soon enough. In the meantime, it had become a fashion among the young to wear dummy stepper tokens as a badge of defiance. It had even generated a kind of street art, as designers extended the wristband concept into loops of copper or even platinum, supposed representations of the chain of worlds that was the long earth. So I think that's just quite a realistic response. I can see all that happening. We also have this awful case of this little girl who basically is almost like step blind, if that makes sense. So someone describes it here. Look, what I believe is that something's gone wrong for Bethany in that tangle of processing. She does the seeing without the stepping. For several hours a day, the world she sees is no longer necessarily the one she's living in. So she blunders into furniture while seeing her kids playing in the world next door. But she can't hear them or touch them, and they, of course, can't see her. And meanwhile, the doctors can't treat what they don't understand. They do say the time she spends seeing wrongly is increasing. Give her another year and her sight will be stuck permanently stepwise. She won't be able to see her kids, even when they're right beside her. I just, I like this little throwaway line here as well. Most long-lived space stations get shabby. They weren't places where you could ever open the windows for a good spring clean. Very true. Although they do have to keep them as clean as possible though. Like I've seen they even have to like hoover up dust like from their dead skin because otherwise it can get into the, you know, equipment. Okay, then um, basically our group of heroes discovers that they need to build this like giant artifact to save the world. And the only way to do that is to work with the silver beetles who we had as kind of the antagonists of the last book. Although... They weren't necessarily ill-meaning, they just threatened to wipe out humanity, almost as like a byproduct. We do have a thing here where Joshua gets, he has a prosthetic left hand from in one of the earlier books, his hand gets bitten off. And he gets it serviced by the Black Corporation. But it's kind of weird that he'd allow them to service, because he'd always said he doesn't want them to provide a new hand for him. Because he doesn't want Lobsang, the AI, to be inside his hand. So it just seems weird that he would let them service it but I'm going to let that one slide. We have a throwback here to the first book because uh, Joshua married a character called Helen, who in the first book was like a 15-year-old girl, and he's got her old journal and he's uh, reading it. It's actually very sad because she's died by this point and he misses her. It's very touching. These animals get attacked and Joshua thinks uh, they're like a cohort of Roman soldiers making a shield wall to face the barbarians. And I just like that because... I watched uh, The Last Kingdom on Netflix and then for ages after I watched that I was going around shouting SHIELD WALL at all sorts of random opportunities. So we have the next in this as well who are like a creature. They're like next generation humans basically. And um, somebody says they have terrible dress sense and one of them replies, Unlike you vain creatures, we choose practicality over looks. That's what I do with my dress sense. We also get this cool bit where the next basically say they've been pre-preparing humanity for something and uh, they get asked how they did it and basically they did it with memes and we get this character called Mr. Driscoll as well who becomes uh, what's his nickname he becomes like the Shakespeare man or something um, because he wants to make sure that culture doesn't die out in the long earths so he creates this replicating machine that can um, turn trees into Shakespeare only then that replicating machine goes out of control and just starts eating all of the trees so this is kind of that that Shakespeare printer in action and also where we start to see something's gone wrong he released his master printer and after his usual refreshing night's sleep in a forest glade went to retrieve this world's brand new copy of the bard he soon found the master copy dormant as usual in a pose that Mr Driscoll no engineer always interpreted as resting after a hard night's work 
and beside it was, not another reading copy with pages still moist, the goal-based ink printing bright, another master copy, another crab-like gadget, a copy of the book on a series of spindly legs. Puzzled, he reached for the new copy, but it scuttled off out of his reach and out of sight. Mr. Driscoll was more irritated than alarmed. He was not a practical man, and was used to machinery of all kinds letting him down. He set the true master copy off on its way to another part of the forest. Perhaps there was something particular. Perhaps there was something peculiar about the trees just here, he wondered, not very scientifically, and waited another night. The next morning there was a fresh reading copy of Shakespeare sitting there on a pile of leaves, just as specified. Mr Driscoll picked it up, took it into the nearest town, and spent a pleasant day talking to some vaguely interested farmers' children in their quaint little school. To Mr Driscoll's taste, this was a particularly pleasing community who, Amish-like, had decided to eschew modern technology as much as possible when shaping their new world. And the next morning, Mr. Driscoll stepped on, thinking no more of Earth West 31,415, until ten days later, an agitated farmer pursued him stepwise and demanded that he come back. Dun dun dun. And uh, that there as well, 31,415, it's discovered that basically something strange is happening on all of the worlds that have, like, digits of pi as their name, as their numbers. So, 31,415. For the record, Pi is, and I'll do this look without looking because I just remember this off the top of my head. Well, I've memorised it at school. 3.14159265358979323846264338327950288841. Useless party trick there. We have a reference to the Long Unity, which is kind of like an updated version of the uh, of the UN. Only they do say it's like a more low key version of it. Character goat called Cutler has got a great line here as well. You know how you can tell a philosopher by how many words he uses when he beefs about the John being blocked. And then we get to this bit. It almost reminded me of Midworld by uh, Aladdin Foster because we're like looking at all the life in uh, the canopy of the the forest basically. But we get these giant trees. They're almost impossibly tall. Um, and yeah, that was that was interesting to read about as well. And we learn about how they came about. Like there's an interesting thing with like they're super lightweight for example because they have these like balloons of um lighter than air weight inside them all very cool so during this adventure joshua ends up this like three mile high plus high tree with a troll uh and i guess this gives you a scale of of, of the size of it he still had that nagging breathlessness how high were they he thought back to denver and its footprints the mile high city Whenever he'd flown in there, it had always take him, taken him a couple of hours to adjust to the thinner air. Was it possible that they were that high? Sancho had been climbing steadily and swiftly for hours, and even if they were a mile high, it was clear that they were nowhere near the top of this tremendous tree. And then they reference to it, refer, refer to it as an Yggdrasil. I think that's how you pronounce it. So we discover that these trees are so light because they're basically full of hydrogen. And that's why uh, the the trolls are so... They, they don't want Joshua to light a fire. And he says, what about fire? Hydrogen is pretty inflammable. Sure, that's why you don't want me building a campfire in the tree canopy the other night, right? And lightning strikes here must cause a hell of a mess. Although I imagine the trees must have evolved some way to resist fire. After all, they are full of bags of water. Loggers, though. Maybe that's why something as obviously useful as reaching wood, ultralight, has never been brought back to the low earths. Because anybody who happened on this band of worlds, if anybody has made it out this far, has on their first night casually built a campfire. Kaboom. Goodbye, loggers. Although I'm not sure, like, surely lightning, I suppose lightning would cause fires. Because the water would conduct electricity, but then I suppose it would put out actual fires because it wouldn't be an electrical fire. And then we get this, we see this self-defense mechanism of what happens when there is a lightning strike. So I'm going to read it here. But out of that plume sailed significant bodies of reaching wood, naturally separating from the disintegrating tree. Branches, chunks of trunk. Many of these were rather like trees themselves, with slim trunks, branches with clusters of leaves, roots dangling in the air like the tentacles of an octopus. They sailed out of the carnage, slowly settling to the ground. They were seedlings, Joshua guessed. Saplings, the descendants of the tree and the repository of its genes, the seeds of the next generation. There even seem to be two kinds, like pollen, like flowers, male and female maybe. And meanwhile, to ensure those seedlings had room to flourish, from out of the dying tree's central blaze flew sparks of liquid light, trailing smoke plumes that were soon miles long. These were branch, these were branch missiles like the ones Joshua had ignited with his matches, but here serving their true purpose. Fire blindly and at random, but in all directions, these splinters of fire sailed into the foliage of the dying tree's equally mighty neighbours. 
Not all the missiles reached the target, not all the targets succumbed to the flames. But enough missiles got through, enough neighbours were destroyed, to ensure that the originating tree seedlings had at least a fighting chance of finding open ground to root in, and sunlight to drink in, away from the shade of more mature competitors. This is kind of a really interesting approach to evolution, that the tree, to ensure the continuation of its DNA line, actually takes out the other trees. We get this line here where Maggie says, Everybody out! They're on a bus, you see. She says, There'll be coffee, food. I'd advise you to use the bathroom on the bus, however. The local facilities, as used by marine jarheads and navy grunts, aren't likely to be pristine. And I would have thought, actually, they would be pretty pristine, because they have, like, a lot of discipline, and, like, you have people whose jobs it is to clean the toilets and stuff. So I imagine they would actually be pretty clean. Joshua, in his old age, he talks to Lobsang, and he says, Lobsang, tell me, how can people so smart commit something so self-evidently wrong? We have this little, lovely little conversation between uh, a kid called Jan and Lobsang, the AI Buddhist monk. <laughs> Mister, you look funny. Lobsang looked down. Well, so do you. Are you a robot? Long story. Jan reached out and poked Lobsang's leg. I bet you're not even alive. I'm so. Prove it. Lobsang leaned down, resting his hands on his knees. Well, that's a little tricky. You could break me down molecule by molecule and find not a single particle of life or mind. On the other hand, I could do the same to you. Jan thought that over. Good comeback. Then he ran off down the beach. Clever kid. We have a little reference here. Um, one of the trolls called Sancho is uh, whistling or singing Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag, which was taught to him by Private Percy in the very first book, or at least was taught to trolls then. Someone's taken a soccer ball with them, or as we would just call it, a football, in their journeys, and, uh, and someone said, I can't believe they brought a soccer ball into interstellar space. Joshua said, I can't believe they're putting a trolling goal. We see some monoliths in this as well, which relate back to some of the exploration on, on the long Mars. And then uh, Agnes as well is finally, she died and then was sort of brought back to life and then died again. And Lobsang said, uh, he's not talking about another incarnation, another robot body. He says, not at all, she is most definitely dead. But all of what she was, I have built into myself. She is not in any kind of bottle somewhere, but she is in the centre of my mind, unchangeable, always cherished. Joshua thought that over. Well, so she is in me. But I didn't need some kind of artificial download to achieve that. It's very cool. Then we just have this poignant moment at the end where the acknowledgements are just written by Stephen Baxter because Pratchett had passed away by this point, whereas they wrote all the previous ones together. Yeah, all in all, this was okay. It was kind of a bit of a lackluster end to the series, to be honest. And part of this is because, again, in the introduction note, they said it was originally going to be one book. Then they kind of wrote The Long Mars as a sequel to that. And then the last book and this book have both just not been too interesting for me. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad I read it and I'm glad I finished it. But definitely read the first book in the series. And if you enjoy that, keep going. And if you don't, don't. Yeah, I gave it a 3 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I thought of The Long Cosmos by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.